Hey, what's up guys? It's Amory. I am here with my June wrap up and my July TBR, as well as a little bit of Because You Love to Hate Me action, which is coming out July 11th. Also, if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, why aren't you subscribed? Hit that red button so we can see more of each other. There are also a few things that I really liked that I want to share with you that I read in the past months. So I don't want it to be too long. And plus I have to show you the hard covers of Because You Love to Hate Me. But right now, the June wrap up. Down Among the Sticks and Bones by Shannon McGuire. This is book two to the Wayward Children trilogy. I believe this probably started off as a standalone with the Every Heart of Doorway novella. And I really enjoy that one. I really love this book too. I think I love it even more than the first one. There was something kind of wonderful. I know what it is. The first book we learn a lot about the children who are basically in a home. Think think like an orphanage for children who have gone to Narnia, who have gone to Oz. They go to these worlds and then somehow they're brought back to our world and they can't really deal. That's really what this home is for. So book two follows two of the main characters that we meet in book one, Jack and Jill. They're both girls, Jacqueline and Jillian. And we learn about their home lives as well as where they went and what happens, well, it's not what happens when they come back. We see where they were and then the land that they went to and then we get more information on why they left because in book one, we just meet them and then we kind of get a hint of what happened to them, but we don't really know. I probably could have read it in one sitting, but because of my schedule, I ended up reading it in three, but it was really, really enthralling and I cannot wait for book three. Shannon McGuire is very prolific. I still haven't read her first book that she wrote under Mira Grant called Feed. It's basically like zombies, uh, in our real world that's very political. really love her imagination. She also has this mermaid kind of horror thing called Rolling in the Deep that I want to get to. I Believe in a Thing Called Love by Maureen Gu. I don't read a lot of YA contemporary fiction. This book was so accurate to Korean culture and Korean American culture. Essentially, this book is about a girl who has a type A personality. She's really terrible at love. She ends up watching some K-dramas because her dad likes the K-dramas. She watches a few and then realizes there's definitely like a step to romance. And so she figures why not not apply those things to her dating life. All kinds of hijinks ensues. Obviously it's not the best thing. What I really liked about this novel aside from all of the laugh out loud parts, Desi is very funny. Like I literally laughed out loud and I don't do that a lot when I'm reading books. I rarely cry or gasp or laugh out loud but there's some things in here there's certain lines of dialogue that I had to read out loud just because they were so funny but it's really clever how not only is the story about a girl who wants to apply like the K-drama steps to romance, basically using like K-drama structure because there are certain things that tend to happen in all romantic comedy type of K-dramas. So not only does she try to apply those rules to her dating life, but the stories, the chapters are structured that way too. So reading the book is like watching a K-drama, a romantic comedy K-drama, which I just love. It's one of my favorite books of the year. I love, 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 love this book. I'm hand selling it to you. The Nix by Nathan Hill. If you saw one of my Friday reads, you saw that I absolutely love this book. I've already been listening to it again on audiobook, so I'm exper experiencing it for the second time on audiobook. This is just one of my favorite books of all time. Oh, actually, I Believe in a Thing Called Love by Maureen Gu is also one of my favorite books of all time. So yes, of the year and also of all time. This book is so fantastic. It's so funny. It's wickedly smart. It's irreverent. He puts so much into this. It's not a small book, but let me tell you, it goes really, really quickly. The character named Ponies that I love so much. The observations that the author makes, the critique that he makes, about, I guess, um, our culture. This book was fantastic. If you're only going to read a couple of books this year, this should definitely be one of them. Read this book. Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. Aging writer Kilgore Trout. He seems to appear in a lot of his books. No, I didn't really get that, that a Midwest car dealer is taking his fiction as truth. That happens for a second, but not really. What follows is murderously funny satire as Vonnegut looks at war, sex, racism, success, politics, and pollution in America and reminds us how to see the truth. I did not really love this book. I actually, I, I can't even say I didn't really love it. I didn't like it at all. I'm still going to try Cat's Cradle, Cat's Cradle, I believe, because I think it's supposed to be one of his um, better works. This book just didn't do it for me. I, I was reading it and I was just, I felt like um, I understood what he was saying about race in a certain way and the ridiculousness of it, but it didn't do enough for me. It didn't say enough. And then I guess he was talking a little bit about sexism and there's just like a lot of like potty humor that I just didn't find funny. So 
This was kind of um, a doozy for me, this one. But I am going to try Cat's Cradle, and I definitely want to try Slaughterhouse 5, depending on how Cat's Cradle goes, so stay tuned. Into the Water by Paula Hawkins, a very loose buddy read with Max from Well Done Books. I really enjoyed this one. It's a thriller about a town in which women tend to die in this one. It's not a, a sinkhole, but it's like a pool of water where the river bends and for some reason people romanticize it and there have been lots of deaths, or at least four deaths. One of the deaths was a woman who died a couple of hundred years ago. She was accused of witchcraft and then sentenced to drown into this pool of water. People basically go up to the cliff and they just throw themselves down and she was sentenced, so she was killed. But there have been a couple of suicides as well. And so we're trying to figure out how everyone factors in, the people in the town, we learn a little bit about each of them and how they relate to one another, and then, of course, secrets are unearthed. I'm still not sure if I enjoyed this a little better than Girl on the Train or vice versa, because they're really different. Both are thrillers, but this one, although Girl on the Train really relied a lot on characterization, this one, I think you sink a little more into the characters. It's more of like a character study, so the plot moves, but it's like a slow burn. This is a book that's best going into knowing that the plot is going to take its time, that it's really about getting to know each of the characters and their personalities and their relationships to one another, some of which are secret relationships. Certain events happen, but there's a lot of space between in which you're just left to sift through the character relationships, but I really enjoyed it. So I don't know which one I liked better. I, I guess I liked them equally, but maybe this one a little bit better than Girl on the Train because it was really intriguing to just watch the characters. This whole thing hinges on the characters and their relationships to one another. So if you're ready for a slow burn thriller, this would be a good one. Another book that I read on ebook was The Lost City of the Monkey God by, I think it's Michael Preston, but I'm going to put it here so you'll see his his name. This was really interesting. It's a nonfiction book. It's basically about the search for the lost city of the monkey god. Later they named it the city of jaguars. Basically the author went on this expedition. He's written other things. He's done documentaries and he had a whole team. They went into the rainforest of South America looking for this specific city that some people didn't even believe existed. There's this mysterious city that was hidden, lost away, and anyone who came upon it would die. Later he tied that into disease and um, the conquistadors and then people coming from Europe and it was amazing to me the facts that he put out there as far as how fast disease spread from Europe and from Christopher Columbus's second journey into South America and even like Hispaniola which is basically like the Caribbean, how fast the indigenous people were killed. Like it's chilling to think of you know, a population dwindling down. It's debated from 1 million or 3 million. And like three years later, or four years later, there's no one left. If you think about the end of days or the apocalypse, that's what it looked like. Like so many people were dying, people which sometimes travel from town to town and come to a town where everyone is dead and they're just walking and there are dead bodies everywhere. Some are in you know, late stages of decay, some are not as as decayed. You're walking and surrounded by death. It's a literal ghost town. There's no one there. That's how fast a lot of these diseases, diseases that were not introduced in the Americas because Europe and Africa and Asia, they, they, they had more, a lot more um, people traveling between there. Even if you go by the theories that the Americas were visited pre-Columbus times um, by Africans and you see the Olmecs and all that stuff, even if you go by that, there's still not enough exposure to disease, closeness to livestock and such that you would have in European uh, and Asian and African villages and cities and towns. So it was just like a whole other ball game. No one could could make it through that. So it's really, really horrific. And of course, when they unearthed this city, he talks about um, what they went through just trying to get it out there, the, the information, the discovery within the scientific, within the archaeological community, and then also what they went through just as far as the bites, like the, the rainforest is trying to kill you. I get itchy just thinking about it because there was like a parasites from little tiny mite type mosquitoes and it's just like oh so small how do they how do they do it yeah it's terrible the crazy thing is that some of these diseases he says are finding their way out because people are on planes now it just takes nothing for someone to hop on a plane and a lot of these things that we would see only in that area of the rainforest in that for people traveling particularly in that area not even outside of it we are now seeing making its way in europe 
and through the Americas, very slowly but surely. So it's just really frightening. Anyhow, an amazing read. If you can't read it, listen to it on audiobook because it's also really interesting on audiobook as well. So I highly recommend that one. I really enjoyed that. So on to my TBR. One of the books that I'm actually reading right now, White Teeth by Zadie Smith. I'm on page 70 right now. So far, I'm really enjoying this one. I really wanted to read a lot of her work. She just had Swing Time come out and I haven't read that one yet, but I wanted to read this one first. Friendship, Love, War, Three Cultures and Three Families Over Three Generations and the tricky way the past has of coming back and biting you on the ankle. So it's still early days but I do tend to like epic family dramas. That's what I'm finding out about myself, that I definitely gravitate towards those when it comes to literary fiction. So we shall see. I am really ready to get into Our Dark Duet by Victoria Schwab, but this is book two in the Monsters of Verity series. I really enjoyed the first book and now we are finishing it off because it's a duology. If you haven't read the first book, it's about a world in which all of the evils that happen in the world have physical manifestations. So if there's a school shooting and let's say the child is killed or kills himself, an echo of himself, a version of himself, a shadow monster of himself wakes up in this world and he wakes up around body bags and he is essentially a monster. And then you have the human beings who are fighting and have essentially walled themselves off in this part of the United States anyway. They've walled themselves off in a city called Verity. So you have Kate Harker, a girl whose father actually like built the wall and helps protect people in the city from these monsters. And then you have, I think his name is August? Yeah, August Flynn, who is one of those monsters. I think he actually was the shadow echo of one of the shooters um, who killed a bunch of children in his own school. He has that blood on his hands when he wakes up, but he doesn't want to be a monster. Victoria Schwab said that the first book is kind of like the origin story of Kate and August and how they came to be and how they came to grow up in their like respective families. And then book two is really where things come to a head and where they really clash, where we really see who they have become. Toni Morrison's God Bless the Child. I don't know anything about this book. Um, I did read Beloved. Or, no, I didn't read Beloved. I read The Bluest Eye um, in university and I really enjoyed that one. I don't know anything about this book. I just know there's a girl named Bride. She's very dark skinned and she goes through some kind of tragic event. There is Booker, the man Bride loves and loses to anger. Rain, the mysterious white child with whom she crosses paths. And then there's her mother and something happened between her and her mother. So I, I basically know nothing about the story, but it's very thin. When it comes to shorter reads especially, I like to know as little as possible so as not to be the least bit spoiled. I'm going in pretty blind with this one, but I think I can trust Toni Morrison. And finally, I definitely want to get to The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue. This was totally on my radar. This is by Mackenzie Lee, and she wrote this monstrous thing, which I really want to read, and I never got a chance to check it out. This story is about two young men of privilege. I'm not sure if his friend has a lot of privilege, they probably are very privileged. They go on a year-long grand tour of Europe. I'm not sure if both of them are bisexual or if one of them is bisexual and one of, I think his friend is gay. I'm not really sure. But basically, I think the main character is trying to find himself, but there's also a secret crush. So there's, there's a little bit of romance between the two characters, but it's unspoken. And that's all I know. That's all I want to know. But this is a really wicked cover. A big thing that got me excited about reading this book was listening to an interview uh, on the First Draft podcast with Sarah Enney. And I already wanted to read this book, but listening to her podcast really like amped the anticipation for this book. And it also made me really want to read uh, this monstrous thing as well. Like she's really into history. She loves like this, this tiny, the tiny details and the nuances of just like character relationships and like social dynamics. And I'm really there for that. So looking forward to this one. Now I got the hardcovers for Because You Love to Hate Me. So I finally get to hold the real thing up. I'm so excited for this. Thank you guys so much for supporting and for all the love you've shown, the excitement you've shown for this book. I'm really, really just thankful. Everyone put in so much work. There was so much work and effort going into just putting this book together from everyone's schedules to their creative efforts to writing. It takes a lot to be able to come up with prompts that you think that an author will love and that also are, are very specific yet loose enough that they won't constrain anyone because it's not like everyone has like three years to write the story and it's a lot to write a short story from a prompt and you know it's kind of scary because you, you really hope that you can do something good but you might be operating out of your wheelhouse and after the prompts were given after the authors went off to work on their short stories the booktubers had to then write creative pieces 
based on their prompt or as far as like, why they chose their prompt, um, some kind of piece related to the prompt. Everyone took like a different kind of angle, a different path. It was a lot of work for everybody and I'm just really, really happy and I'm really proud of the final product. And working with the publisher and on the cover, it was just a lot of fun. Like everyone had really great ideas. I love that this is just 3D and it's shimmery and this is kind of like shiny and black. It's just... I'm just really happy and just excited. If you haven't already, pre-order this book. It comes out July 11th. We've got some cool events coming up. A lot of the contributors and myself will be at Barnes & Noble at The Grove in Los Angeles, July 12th at 7 o'clock, so make sure you come through. And if you say the secret word, if you whisper to me the secret word, Hoya Saxa, if you're one of the first five people to do so, I will give you a UK edition of Because You Love to Hate Me. So make sure you come through and whisper that to me. Also going to be at San Diego Comic Con, so make sure you come through for that. And I will also be at Pasadena Loves YA, which is a YA festival in Pasadena, California. So this is on the TBR too, because it would be the first time that I'm reading the stories in hardcover, like in an actual book, which is amazing. And also the audiobook is in the works and the audiobook should be released the same day. That's what we're trying to time. We're trying to time the same day. So July 11th, we should also have the audiobook, which is amazing because we have two narrators. I'm narrating the intro and I actually already narrated the intro. I actually went in and did that, which was a lot of fun. And Julia Whelan is narrating the stories with female protagonists. She's narrated Gone Girl, The Grown Up, lots of wonderful things. And Kevin T. Collins has narrated the stories that have a male character. He's also narrated Beautiful Creatures, which is what made me fall in love with that story. He's so great with doing different voices and accents. So, so excited that they're going to be reading this. Yes. I narrated the intro and let me tell you, it's hard work because when you're just reading a story and you have that mic, there was like so much mouth. I could hear so much of my mouth and I was like, whoa, they're like, yeah, we, you know, we equalize it, we take it out and we can do all these things. The engineer was telling me this. Kudos to audiobook narrators. I will be buying my copy when it comes out. July 11th is the goal. So that's my June wrap up and my July TBR, as well as a little bit of Because You Love to Hate Me news. Oh, I did an Instagram live situation today and a lot of people were asking what lipstick I had on. This is Max Metallic Anything Once. I usually don't do metallics, but I'm just feeling like experimenting these days. Actually kind of matches like this. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like the video. If you liked it, please subscribe. If you haven't already subscribed, why haven't you subscribed? Do it now, let's make it happen, let's do this thing. And also, please let me know below what you're reading this month and what you're planning to read in July. I am out of my reading slump now, thank goodness. I will see you guys later, bye!